Well, my next guest is an interesting chap. He's the chairman of a think tank on social affairs, but it's probably reasonable to call him a bit of a futurist as well because he looks at past events, history, contemporary ideas, technology, innovation, social change, and tries to glean, in part from that, where we're heading, what sort of a society we're building. His name is Mal Fletcher. He's coming to Australia next month, in fact, to Queensland, as I understand it. He's the chairman of 2020 Plus. Mal Fletcher, good afternoon to you. I think you're in Spain at the moment, Mal. I am, Steve. Yes, very beautiful afternoon. Good evening to you. Well, it's uh, lovely to have you along. I really appreciate you taking time out. A pleasure. I want to draw just a couple of different themes and ideas from you, first of all, uh, if, if I can. You talk uh, a bit about sort of the future and things that will guide it and lead it and create it. And, and one of the things that's predicated on is you talk about millennials, is this, this group of people who will have a big impact on the future. First of all, who are millennials? What are they? Well, it, it's a name we have for a generational cohort, a group of young people who are aged today in Australia between about 5 and 25. Um, some call them Generation Y, but the research we've done suggests they don't much like that name because it ties them too much to Generation X, and they don't feel they have much in common with that generation. Um, it's a generation that's shaped, uh, as any generation, by shared experiences, and uh, the millennials are particularly um, shaped by, first of all, very good nurturing and protection uh, in childhood. Some would say they've been overprotected. You mean they had good parents, Mal Fletcher? They've had good parents, and most of their parents are younger baby boomers and older Gen Xs, and, and they're also the first digital generation, Steve. They've been raised with digital technology from birth and as a result of all of that I think they tend to be quite optimistic about the future and, and the part they can play in it. Um, they're quite civic minded, you know, they believe in the power of the collective to get things done on a big scale and being digital means they're also quite prone at times to switch off quickly and, and to switch off completely um, and so employers, for example, sometimes find it difficult to get millennials working in a in a long-standing project with a multi-generational team. And that's one of the things we're talking about uh, when I'm in Brisbane. These millennials, they're going to be terribly influential on the future, as, as, I, as I read your writings. In what way? Why are they going to be so influential? Well, first of all, by virtue of their size. Um, it's a bigger generation, demographically speaking, than even the very large boomer generation of which I'm a part. Um, so in numbers alone, it's very influential, but also in terms of their positive outlook on things. Uh, they do tend to believe that their generation will have a bigger impact on history than any generation in modern or postmodern times. For example, one survey here in Europe not so long ago asked millennials, uh, what are the two groups of people that will have the biggest impact on the future? And their answer for me was intriguing. Number one, young people. Number two, scientists. And uh, that says a lot to me about the way they're willing to engage the future. And, I, and I'm very passionate, uh, Steve, about the idea that it isn't technology that shapes the future. And it's not even events that shape the future. It is human choice and human response to technology and events. So the way these young people respond is going to shape the future. You argue, I think, that this is the first generation born into full-blown globalism. What, what are the globalist forces that they were born into? What, what does that mean? How is that different from, say, from our, our you know, boomer generation, or in my case, Generation Jones, I think I am? <laughs> generation Jones. I think uh, uh, globalism, you know, I mean, in, in strict terms, simply means the breaking down of barriers, doesn't it? The barriers mm. to trade, economy, travel, migration... Um, and globalism has given rise to uh, government policy now in parts of the world, including Australia, which we call multiculturalism, you know, putting as many diverse groups as you can into a small space and hoping that it creates a more colourful culture. In most cases, it does. Um, and then linked to that is, is pluralism, which basically says, well, if we're going to have so many diverse cultures living in a small space, we're going to have to get used to the idea that there's more than one way to do something, uh, at the end of the day, perhaps people are saying all ideas of truth are equally true. You know, all lifestyles are equally valid. Whether that's true or not, I, I don't know. But those are the forces that feed into globalism. So they're postmodernist, cultural relativists, that sort of thing. 
Yeah, that's the that's the the environment, the milieu that they were born into. I mean, that postmodernism really started as a as a movement in the arts and architecture back in the 30s and 40s, but it didn't find its way into mainstream thinking and culture until you know the late 60s, early 70s. And so the whole relativistic way of seeing things is something that millennials have grown up just assuming uh, today. And so there are many arguments we would have had in the in the 60s and 70s uh, on moral uh, and ethical issues that they won't even have today because they just assumed uh, a different starting point. If you've just tuned in, I'm speaking with a chap by the name of Mal Fletcher. Mal Fletcher is chairman of 2020 Plus. It's a London-based think tank on social affairs. It's quite a high profile in London, although Mal Fletcher is originally Australian, I think. How long have you been living in London, Mal Fletcher? Uh, well, we've lived in, Aust- in London for just five years. We lived in Copenhagen, Denmark for 10 before that, and uh, I was 30, 37 when I left Australia. So if you're like, two-thirds of, my, of, of me are Australian and one-third is European now. <laughs> Thank you. Now, let me ask you something else. Let me continue on to the, to the next step. Uh, part of the feature of of the world that's growing and that's developing is that you describe it, I think, as, a, as an age of post-ideology politics that, that I think in particular you argue that political parties haven't come to grips with the fact that in the age of post-ideology politics we're looking for something more than personality to take place. We're looking for leadership based on conviction, not convenience. What do you mean? Well, there's two questions there. Uh, on the ideology side of it, um, you know, society generally in the developed world is becoming deinstitutionalized today. Um, generally speaking, people are much less inclined to belong to a religious group or a social club just because their parents did. Uh, and that's also true in the area of political affiliation. Um, there is evidence that when we're really unsure of who to vote for, we will fall back on family loyalties. But we're more open to being convinced, I think, by alternative points of view than perhaps our parents were. Um, So political parties uh, are starting to slowly get used to the idea that they can't preach ideology, uh, that they have to talk more about perhaps values and specific issues. That's partly a response to rapid change. You know, ideology is too rigid to provide answers in times of change. But it's also because people are not looking for dogmatic, rigid systems of thought. If, in a way, they're looking more for worldview, for a, um, a framework for thinking. So politicians, like all leaders, have to be able, have to be skilled at uh, giving the worldview behind their decisions. You know, what basis, what's the basis on which they would take a difficult uh, decision and where those convictions lie uh, behind that worldview. But it's, it's less about ideology. I assume that must apply not just to political groupings, but also to religious, philosophical, cultural and more, right across the board. Yeah, it does. It applies in the corporate world. It applies in civic leadership. Um, I just heard you talking to your other guest about uh, King Lear, and, and it is true that you know human beings since the time of Shakespeare haven't essentially changed, but um, times change. Insecurities remain pretty much the same, I think. And in times of unprecedented change, you know, we look for leaders who can act as landmarks, um, You know, the people that can be that one unshifting point of reference in a storm of change. Uh, I don't mean unshifting in the Luddite sense, you know, totally resistant to any form of forward movement. I mean unshifting in the sense that decisions, sometimes very rapid decisions, are made on the basis of proven values. And I think that's what leaders of all stripes need to be good at today, very strategic in our thinking, um, identifying not just future trends but likely human need in response uh, to those trends and trying to get ahead of that curve. A good example, if you want one, is is the iPhone. Um, you know, it, it's a, a real game changer in terms of technology. Mm. There's already been two billion application downloads for this thing, and it's only been on the market for what three years. Um, and if you'd done a market survey, Steve, five years ago, you would have found hardly anybody saying, "I really need something on my mobile phone to help me unlock my car." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes. The technology has given rise to a new perceived need. So the, the needs change. But even behind that, you know, the iPhone is built on certain strong convictions, you know, good design, quality manufacture, backup service, customer loyalty. This isn't an ad for iPhone. I don't even own one. But the principle I'm trying to get across is there is convenience. It meets a need, but it's also based on some proven conviction. Let me pursue that conviction angle a little bit more. You say that leadership, what the times demand is leadership based on conviction. This is 
uh, interesting, I think, in Australia's context at the moment because our Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, I'm not sure if you're up on this, one of the, the, the key elements that, that got him into power, many argue, was the, the promise to do something about global warming and climate change. And he had a policy platform of a, an emissions trading scheme as a result of that. And, and it was shelved in the last week. He, he, he basically put it on the shelf and said, I'm not going to tackle it now, you know, two, three years down the track, you know, politics uh, allowing. And there's been a huge response in his popularity as a result, a, a dropping of his popularity stakes and people are privately saying, well what does he believe in? What 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 is the thing he stands for if this what what he described once as the greatest moral issue of our time is so easily put on the shelf for political reasons? Yeah, I did read about that with interest yesterday actually, and um it is a good illustration of the point. I think what people ask then is, you know, how much is your stance on this? Um, a big plank in your platform and how much is it a small one? If it's a small plank in your overall platform, then we can forgive a certain amount of pragmatism, a certain amount of fluidity based on changing situations. But if it is a big plank, if it's something that you've declared to be a major core conviction, um, then we don't expect you to change. We expect you to stand firm on it because you are our reference point on that issue. Um, we are faced with all so many different voices, even in the scientific community, um, not so much about the fact of global warming, but about who's to blame. Uh, and we, we don't know quite who to believe. So we look to you politicians to give us your conviction. Um, so I think if he's made it a major plank of his platform, then yes, it is going to be a problematic now that he's shifting ground. If it's a small plank, people can forgive, as I say, a certain amount of pragmatic change in response to a fluid situation. If you've just tuned in, my guest is Mal Fletcher. He's chairman of 2020 Plus. One of the things you've written about that intrigues me, Mal Fletcher, is, you, you, is on, along this line, but you say leaders must become cultural architects. Explain that to me. What is a cultural architect? Well, you know, my background, uh, originally I studied architecture, and architecture is all about creating space in, in which people can, you know, go through life, experience life, and hopefully space that enhances their life. And in a way, leaders of all stripes, corporate leaders, civic leaders, politicians, um, are responsible for creating uh, a space, an environment, an ambience in which people can flourish and projects can fly. Um, I was reflecting yesterday on how much change we're seeing today. I was, I was thinking back on the words of Elvin Toffler, you know, in the 1970s in that seminal book, Future Shock, when he said there's going to come a roaring current of change that will leave people feeling disoriented. Um, two years ago, Steve, I don't know if you're aware of this, but an international conference of psychiatrists declared ours to be the age of paranoia. Um, I wasn't aware of that, no. Well, a, le a leading British psychiatrist uh, last year said that uh, one in four Brits have irrational fears, and, and many of those, he said, are based on things like urban isolation and the pace of change. Um, and so in the midst of all that change, some of it generated by environmental concerns that you just touched on, some by technology. The great hope for the future, I think, is human ingenuity. The greatest hope we have for the future in many ways is the 10 billion neurons inside the human brain. And we need leaders who can equip people with the skills, the confidence to innovate under pressure in the face of change. So here we are in the age of paranoia, as the British psychiatrist dubbed it. Let me You've mentioned Alvin Toffler. He's quite interesting that his book, Future Shock, was a real benchmark and a, a dystopian view of the future in which he correctly predicted, uh, I think you've written, you know, with the incredible pace of change and the amount of information that's available, it actually leaves people feel disorientated and depressed. This is the opposite of what it was supposed to achieve. Yeah, in many ways, I suppose. And um, what was interesting to me about that book, now that I look back on it, you know, it's 40 years old. Um, there's not a single mention of mobile phones. There's not a single mention of sat navs or any of the, the gadgets that we think of as being manifestations of future thinking. What Toffler was so good at was identifying um, the, the psychology uh, of change and what would happen in people's minds and, and attitudes to social responsibility in the face of change. Yeah, I, I think that it's not the change people fear today, Steve. I think we're, we're more um, fearful, it, it may not even be the right word, we're more apprehensive about the pace of change. It's how quickly mm. things are changing on so many fronts at once. It's not as if we have you know, change in, in 
social uh, areas of social responsibility, and then and then next year we have change in technology. It's rapid change across almost every front, and uh, and that's the thing that people are finding difficult to deal with. I think one of the best ways I heard perhaps the the what used to be called the generation gap explained today is that with my generation or my parents' generation everything was certain. Now with my generation nothing is certain. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of truth in that. I mean, what can you uh, in terms of normal everyday life? What can you rely on mm. that you know for sure is not going to change by next year? Very good point. With all of our this rapid change, the age of paranoia, the, the, the mass of of competing cultures, ideologies, uh, conviction positions. The question comes up, what does it actually mean to be human? You, you write that with, uh, with all this sparkling new technology, it'll leave our children and their children grappling with the question, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be human, Mal Fletcher? That's a big question. Yeah, I mean, that's a three-day question. Probably one for, more for theologians and philosophers than for social commentators. But um, I, I think that the, the point I make in, in the writing you're, you're quoting from there is that as we invite technology more into our bodies now, you know, we, we spent a century in the 19th century inviting technology into our workplace. The 20th century, we, we increasingly invited it into our homes. And now we're inviting it more and more into our bodies. And it, it's, it's a wonderful thing, for example, to be able to inject a nano robot into your bloodstream to measure your insulin levels and, and blood pressure and so on. Um, so what, what's, a nano, what's a nano robot? We've heard a bit about nanotechnology, but not much. Well, uh, nanotech is a technology that allows us to build machines from the atomic level up. So instead of building things with large pieces of material that we can handle or machines can handle, you know, we're talking about micro, sub-microscopic particles and building very minute uh, machines that are really uh, impossible to see with the, the human eye. And this is not futuristic. This is happening now. So, uh, you know, if you saw the movie Inner Space, that's probably the most populist uh, uh, representation of nanotechnology. Mm -hmm. um, but this is good technology in the sense that it allows us to know things about our physical condition we would not otherwise know. Um, but again, the question is not the technology. That's amoral. The question is what we will do with it. And we will have to, I think, reflect more and more on what it means to be a human being, where we draw the line between man and machine. So I think in the next 10 years, Steve, we're going to see ethicists uh, becoming part of a of a very big growth industry. If someone's listening tonight and they want a, they want some idea of what to suggest to their high school student about a good career, it might seem a strange one, but believe me, ethics and professionals who do nothing but look at ethics are going to be in big demand in the business uh, world in the years to come. Simply because the rate of technology, its change, is is really challenging the idea of what it means to be human and how we should behave as a result. Yes, it's raising a whole series of, of uh, new questions. For example, um, in the age of Facebook, you know, 400 million people, I think it is, uh, Facebook claims now, um, 50 million tweets a day on Twitter. Um, in that age, do we prefer cyber to real? Um, I don't know how much you read about it in Australia, the case of Joseph Fritzl in Austria, um, who kept his daughter locked up for 18 years in a basement and fathered several children by her. And no one in that small village in Austria seemed to hear anything in all those in all those years. And yet, some sound engineers did test there and apparently found that it's quite possible people did hear something. And yet, if they did, they chose to do nothing about it. So maybe it's easier, not just in Austria, but you know, worldwide, for us to talk on Facebook than over the back fence. So there's a big question there: How do we deal with keeping our human interactions alive face to face when technology means that we we tend to be staring more at screens?